Uh, today we are here for Herding Cats, standardizing engineering processes. So what we want to talk about today is standardization and looking at this many people in the room, you might be in the wrong room because nobody likes standards this much. And we totally agree. Standards can be really annoying and limiting, but we want to change your mind today and show you some best practices on how to actually use standards to benefit your teams rather than add burden to them. And we use the term herding cats, but before getting kicked off, to make a really boring topic a little more humorous, we wanted to use you know, a fun title, but wanted to explain it a little bit more too. So herding cats is an idiom, and to put it to life, want everybody to, for a second, picture every person in this room as a cat. You know, no, there's no quiz at the end. We're not gonna call anyone out and say, oh, my neighbor's grumpy cat or anything like that. So don't worry who you're picturing is that. Picture all of you cats being asked to come to this room. It would be chaotic. There would be a lot of screaming, a lot of hissing, a lot of meowing, and very few cats in this room. You know, and that's really what herding cats is about, is trying to drive people and teams that have different mindsets and different beliefs into a common, you know, a common goal. And that's really what standardization can be like at times. So if it's so tough, why the heck are the three of us here talking about it, and why do we continuously subject our teams to new standards and new ideas? Well, a little bit about me is that I joined Red Hat a little over two years ago in the Red Hat in-vehicle operating system team. When I joined, that program was in its wild, wild west phase. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in our next talk. Uh, but, you know, really, we had a blank slate to start with. We didn't have any processes, we didn't have any standards, and we were free to find the best ways for our teams to work to enable them to thrive. And at that same time, I had joined the technical enablement pillar where I met Marcella and Lucy, and I was learning all the awesome things that they were doing across the entire portfolio and delivery team in RHEL and beyond, and wanted to find synergies so we could actually collaborate and find ways for our teams to work together. And really, that's how the three of us started working together. So I'll turn it over to Lucia. Yeah, hi everybody. Uh, so I used to work with uh, RHEL folks, like engineering teams in RHEL. And unlike um, in vehicle operating system, we are here for, we were here for quite some time. So you can imagine we had all those processes in place, but we not always understood the processes that were in place or knew why they are in place. Um, while well, now I'm with different team, with in different uh, dynamics, the dynamic in RHEL was uh, steady and sturdy. And uh, all together with different um, mindset, we are trying to bring all those people together where it's, it's wild west and steady and sturdy uh, process with RHEL. So uh, it's a challenging. And here uh, we have also Marcella. Yeah. I'm Marcela Mashalanova. I'm in Red Hat for 17 years, and most of the time I was working on RHEL in various roles. Uh, last two years I'm working on, well, <laughs> on project management, let's say, or agile, as agile coach. And I was looking at RHEL data and how to work with them better. And we were cooperating on making them more accessible to our teams. All right, so I mean, we already introduced the topic, but a little bit more about what we're going to introduce today. And it's really the fine line about implementing restrictive standards and standards that actually help your team to reduce the burden and make their job easier, not only within your small team, but across the portfolio as well. And then we'll give you a sneak peek into some of the things that the three of us have collaborated on and done to, to really show the light of you know, how standards can help. But, I want to ask everybody here, who likes being told what to do? Oh, we have one person. Oh, we have a few. All right. You guys can leave. You guys are all set. No, no, we need them in our teams. So. Okay, yeah. Actually, please join us. Who here likes being told what to do and how to do it? Probably even less people. Wow, Clara loves that. Neil, Neil likes some certainty in his life. Not a lot of people like that. And... A lot, a lot of people like being told what to do, especially when there's not really a reason to be told what to do. They're not understanding the purpose behind it. 
it, it gets annoying. It feels restrictive. It feels like you're not trusted. And it breaks down every rule that Lucia presented in her talk yesterday about trust, respect, and humility. But still, we wanted to subject you to a fake standard today. So I'll let Lucy go against all her own rules. <laughs> All right, so you can standardize almost anything, but for the sake of this presentational tool, we chose workflows because they are easy to visualize. Um, as you can see on the screen, uh, this workflow consists of three statuses, new, in progress, done. And I would like you to raise a hand if you think this workflow could work for you and your team. Okay, I see a couple of hands up. All right, but definitely not everybody. Like, I saw maybe three hands. And it's a common situation. If, we, if you show something that you are thinking about, there is not a lot of buying, uh, definitely not at the first stage. Uh, so if we move um, to the next slide, we don't want to subject anyone <laughs> to like a, as a persona. So we are using proto personas. It means, it means like made up persona, but they definitely come up from uh, experience. So here I present you Edel, Desi, and Ada. Those are our three proto personas for today um, with all valuable uh, reasoning for extending the workflow we presented earlier. So Edel, he's a um, software engineer, works upstream, and uh, you know sometimes the issues upstream can get in progress even sooner then you start working on them, or vice versa. So he would like to actually have a status to call out that something in upstream is already in progress, not in progress in general. So he would like to have that specific status added to the workflow. Reasonable, right? Desi, she is a project manager and she goes through a lot of approvals and pre-approvals. So she would really benefit from adding pending approval status and approve, like it would make her life super easy. And Ada, the third proto persona that we have, she's a product owner, and uh, before she puts anything to the team's backlog, she would like for them to work on, she would like to have some mock-up for stakeholders with you. Reasonable. All right, so we, <laughs> if we take all of these suggestions in mind, we have interesting workflow in place. So those of you who raised the hand, or those of you who hesitated to raise your hand, would this workflow work for you? <laughs> All right, so I see some scared faces, definitely not, right? You cannot account for every corner case. It's not realistic. You are actually, like right here, we would create artificial complexity at its best. Nobody would understand the hell out of, out of this. Like, it's completely mind-blowing. Okay, so should the stakeholder review be the second state or almost the last one? And approve. So what does the approve mean? Every team could picture the status definition differently. So once you start making those little tweaks to the standard for corner cases, it's not the standard anymore. But you might ask the question, okay, so, but you don't have to make everybody um, for the one standard or put them on the one line. Okay, so take two. Uh, let them have their own workflows. All right, we could do that. We could definitely do that under one premise. We don't need them to collaborate, okay? If we don't need them to collaborate and they will never talk to one another, it's okay. Like, they don't have to know their, each other's workflow, but in case we want them to work together or there is a um, high probability that folks will work on different projects or switch teams, imagine you are an engineer and going from one team to another, from quarter to quarter, or collaborating with someone else and you come to a new team, new workflow, new team, new workflow. Is that really that different? Are those different workflows that different to do and you are they really that different uh, so if really if we really want the, the teams to collaborate together ideally there should be some similarity otherwise it creates chaos yeah that's me <laughs> <laughs> so i came to those four workflows and i was trying to create some reporting some dashboard which will represent all those data so, not easy, because I had to always ask those teams, what does it mean, what's approved? Does it mean it's also delivered, or it's 
if it's done, or is it done only in upstream? What does it mean? So that was really confusing, and I suppose it's same for all team leaders or those who need to manage those data and represent them somehow to higher levels. And it's also confusing for teams, as Lucy mentioned, when you are going, even if you are working in one team and you should report something into another team and they have completely different workflow, that it might, then it might be hard. And it means that you need to communicate about data which should be readable and doesn't need more explanation, but they need to be explained again. So something is wrong. Also, in my case, a lot of, a lot of stuff is not documented because it's sort of tribal knowledge. We are doing it for 20 years or more, so it's clear, right? It wasn't. <laughs> so we are trying to find a balance together. <laughs> We discussed it for a long time, how to do the standard, and that we, that we can't compromise too much when we are creating them, because then it's not standard, because you will lose all the requirements you get from teams. It's just uh, something which is not useful to anyone, it's just forced to the team. And setting good standard is not easy, because the balance between complete freedom, do whatever you want, just give me some status, how are you doing, and mm. provide some guidelines is hard. So, we go to the next slide and talk about what we try to do. We believe we need to understand lots of stuff. <laughs> Firstly, we need to understand teams. So we recommend to work with teams directly. The best thing is to be part of the team and work with them every day so you can observe the process, how does it work, so you can propose something meaningful. You can even see bottlenecks and propose how to remove them. And then you have some business, business needs and you need to report from the team up. So you have some requirements, but you should make them easy for the team, because team would like to create a code and not to fill some fields and reports. So it must be useful for both sides. And then the third one, we believe we can do even a little complicated process, but we need to understand tooling we are using so we can make it easier for people. In our case, we use a lot of automation and tooling around data visualization, and the processes we propose are easy to adopt and they can be uh, scaled to bigger teams or different teams. And we have more best practices. <laughs> so we try to implement these with teams and we also get some requirements from program. Program usually comes to team and ask them could be up just another field because we need this definitely for reporting. But it ends up like the team is not interested so much. They don't want to fill just another third field when they don't see any connection to them and why they should be doing that. So let's try to implement something which doesn't bother team too much. And if you are trying to go for a standard, don't do it just because. <laughs> There has to be a reason. There's really a reason why the standard has to be in place. And uh, I'm an adult practitioner, so I live and thrive under like improvement culture. So ideally, the standard shouldn't make people's life worse, but better. Um, so just if you remember this super complex workflow with artificial complexity, don't implement standards like that. Uh, the standard that is in place or you are trying to book something down, it shouldn't introduce overhead or unnecessary complexity for the teams nor programs. It's really tough. It's easier said than done, uh, but there has to be a reason for a standard. And then Marcella had touched on a couple of these earlier on. And first of all, she had touched on it's important to be involved with the teams and being engaged in the teams but it's not enough to just be engaged with the team as you're collaborating on a new standard idea. 
it's important to keep them engaged throughout the process. So once it's implemented, you have to maintain that communication and maintain that documentation so the teams are aware, hey, this is what's going on, this is how other teams are using it, this is why it's important. Because the moment a team member feels like they understand the why, they're a lot more likely to buy into the, the how. So we find it very important to communicate and continue revisiting these standards. You know, Lucy touched on Agile. Continuous improvement is a huge thing for us and for everybody in this room, I would assume. So it's important for us to con continue adop adapting our standards as things change and keep the documentation up to date because up-to-date documentation means it's easy for people to find what they need. And I didn't mean to pl flash the laser pointer in somebody's eyes, so I apologize. I'll have to keep them away. Yeah. Yeah. We saw you getting bored, sorry. <laughs> so in our teams, we discuss what we can do similarly and also save some of our time to reuse our work, but it wasn't so easy. In the end, we standardized on Jira setup because we believe we should end up with unified backlog where the whole team will see what they should be doing next, what has the highest priority, uh, what is stuck in progress. So, uh, we also work on similar screens and consistent fields. I have one example. We are tracking in our bug request architecture where the bug occurred and we had three fields for that, so it was very confusing. Once it was architecture, one hardware. So going from one project to another, it was hard to find the field. It, well, we are doing better now. <laughs> then there is traceability process. Um, if you want to also figure out what you fixed and how you test it, later on in the process, it's good to have some process for it. So we standardized on this one, and now it's used in all projects in a similar way. Jira automation rules. Um, I like, I, my relationship towards Jira is love or hate, uh, and the same with automation rules, because, you know, uh, there's, but there is so much that you can do with them. Um, and I was fortunate enough to work with Alison, who is great with documentation, and her automation rules just um, triggered another line of thought that what we could do in our teams. Since we had already similar hierarchy, similar workflows, I could just by two clicks implement a really easy automation rules for us. And picture this, uh, you move simple task or story in progress but you forgot to move the same, like epics, one um, level above that we have epics, and it's stuck in to do. And the whole reporting suddenly doesn't make any more sense, and it's manual work, nobody likes to do um, paperwork for Jira. Why not have automation to do it? Since Alison already standardized the process into one really simple, well, it's not that simple, but it was easy for me to implement her work, it was just few clicks for me to do the same for my teams. We already had similar hierarchy, we already had similar workflows. In a matter of few minutes, I was able to, for them to adopt and no longer care about switching the status um, on epics if they change status on stories or one level below. It's really that simple. If you, these are the benefits that come from the standardization, not the automation itself, but what the automation gives to you. Ideally time, or that you don't have to care about the manual stuff. Another one, this is interesting, and Marcella already touched on that, uh, when she was tasked to have one unified dashboard. If you are with big products or big programs, ideally you want them to, uh, want teams to see one unified dashboard. I know, I know I'm agile practitioner usually embedded in teams and I know for the sake of teamness, it's really good to have a team dashboard. But at some point you have to see from, you know, step back and from the whole scale, no matter if you're a manager or just a like engineer, you want to have the overall look like what's going on on the entire product or program for that sake, the standard could really help you to build program dashboards, and you can subtract the data also for the team one. You can have two. 
Um, but really, the building blocks are similarity and similarity in what you are using in standard. And then another thing that we had worked together to implement is a standard status report mechanism. So back when I joined the tech pill, Marcella had really, really long hair, but that was before she was tasked with moving status reports into a standard tool. <laughs> Since then, we've seen a lot of new hairstyles. <laughs> I kid. But really, it was a complex ask. There were Google Docs, there were emails, there were smart sheets, there was Google Forms. There was status being provided to managers in about 967 different places. And that is an actual number. I joke, I joke. Uh, uh, but it was really, it was complicated. So we wanted to find a way that would not only benefit the management team who was consuming the status, but also the individual contributors that were actually submitting the status. So we had all gotten together and we came up with this status reporting mechanism that actually leverages just about everything else that's mentioned on this, deck, or on this slide here, where everybody was using a standard workflow standard fields, and then because of that, we could implement JIRA automation rules on top of it. We could then have a standard dashboard that can be used across the entire enterprise. So uh, the VP of Linux engineering, the QE manager, the automotive manager, you know, directors, everybody can look at a single dashboard and see the roll up of data and get a high level overview of what's going on in a really quick way. And then also for the individual contributors, you just put your status in a JIRA card, the end, forget it, JIRA automation does the rest. And it, it's been really, really helpful. And we'll talk a little bit more about the impacts in a, another slide here. And last but not least, a partner management process. This is something that's really important in Red Hat, especially being an open source company. We have partners that are logging directly into our JIRA instance. They are logging bugs, viewing bugs, viewing feature requests, all of that alongside our engineering team. So it's really important that we have a process in place that will protect our data and their data. So with NDAs being really, really important, we can't leak sensitive information. So together we've been collaborating on a new partner management process, which means the same fields need to be selected in the same manner across all of the different products and programs to make a bug or a JIRA issue visible. And by doing that, we're reducing the risk of data leaks because engineer in product one doesn't have to remember a different process for product one as they do in product two, three, four, and five. So this has been really, really helpful and it's still in the process of being rolled out and adopted, but we're really, really excited about this one. So the impact. We talk a lot about what we've done, but what does this actually mean to the team? What does this mean to the company? And what does this mean to management? Well, I talked about status reports. Status reporting mechanism has actually reduced the time it takes managers to put together, consume, and roll up a status report by 67%. How did we get this number? It used to take hours for managers to go through those 967 different data sources to figure out what story they needed to tell, what was most important. But now they go to a JIRA dashboard and they can produce a status that's worth rolling up to the VP level and beyond within minutes. So that's been a huge, huge win. And the more teams that start adopting this, the better, because that means less and less places that need to be done or need to be go need to be reviewed to actually pick up on the story. And then also, this is another one Marcella had touched on a little bit but a 63% reduction in number of fields on screens for the programs that we're working with. We've aligned on different fields like architecture and I think 80 other fields to figure out a standard use case for these fields, figure out what was important about them, why are they being used, and then being able to trim the number of fields that are on those JIRA screens. So, all right, great, we reduced the number of fields. Why does anybody care? Well. You think about the guy in the back that shrugged his shoulders when he asked about if you liked a workflow that was simple. People like it simple. They don't want to look at 87 different fields that they're never going to use. They only want to put the fields in place that are, or have the fields visible that they're actually going to use. So this reduces clutter on the screen and makes creating JIRA issues far easier, which means more accurate data in the long run. The less bothered people are to do something, 
the more likely they are to do it right. Well, do we have here what we would like to see in the future? And I leave the camera for a minute. So we have seen before, you should see the world here. And it should be on story and epic level, provide the status of the Sudan, and maybe some due date or something what, what they agreed on. And then we have projects back home where we can see features. The features can overlap more things, so it's really important that teams have same statuses at least, and some additional fields depends what we need to report on. So you can see the progress, and then the feature will be delivered. And I must know that Red Hat is doing awesome features, but we usually don't call them like this. I make them up. <laughs> and then there might be some strategic backlog where there'll be even bigger pieces of work which can overlap over the use. So even more standardization is needed. But we hope it will be something like that. <laughs> so not there yet. Not there yet, but the standards are helping us get there. So What's next? The unified backlog is part of it, but what's next for each and every person in this room? We want you guys to go home, and you don't have to do it today because it is the weekend and you're already learning too much, but think about the teams that you're working in. Think about the processes that you have in place, and think about what you can do to collaborate with similar teams, with similar programs, and with similar engineers around you to standardize processes. And we're not asking you to go standards crazy and implement a standard for every single thing you do because like Lucy had mentioned, that's not helpful either. You have to pick and choose what's important to standardize. And it's similar to, if anybody was just here with Yelenia's presentation, it's very similar to that. Focus on what matters and focus on the processes that are having the most burden on the teams or that are the biggest problems. So think about that Think about ways that you can collaborate and take something totally chaotic and make it meaningful. Reduce the burden on engineers and make everybody's day more enjoyable. And really, we, we want the sky to be the limit for you guys. Go back home, think about this, and imagine what's possible to make your team's days better. So that's all we have. Thank you all very much. I won't point on you with the laser pointer, I promise. So you, you decided to like uh, have a unified process of standardizing, let's say, for different things to be cross-functional. Now the question is, how does this translate when you have like external kind of contributors as part of, let's say, as part of the community that they might be working on some project? Are they involved into that or not yet and you are continuing to do it at some point? Okay, so the question is, what we've talked about has been internal only. Has any of these processes been extended for external partners or for the community? And at this point, these are all internal only, but trying to roll in the external is actually really the phase we're at right now. And the partner management process is a great example of that. Marcel has spent a lot of time working with these external partners to make sure that our onboarding process matches their needs and that when they're logging in, they're having a consistent process that they're used to, not only from their existing tooling, but from you know what they are expecting to see in the fields that they need to fill in. And if there's anything else that you want to add to that, Marcella. Well, with the community, we expect that people will probably start to logging into Archera instance, but I don't have any experience with that in projects I follow. I think yeah, we have uh, we have some automation in place to be able to sync tickets from GitHub to Jira, and the idea is that you are able to basically work pretty much on GitHub only, and just the ticket is automatically created on Jira. Uh, it does not get assigned to the epics and the following features, but that's the way my team does it is like basically once a week we go through all these other tickets that have been created upstream, sync internally to Jira and that are not assigned to the APIC, and then we, when we assign them uh, as a priority, that's every now and then. So
processes, and therefore we are able to work, particularly able to work on GitHub, but with the automation where uh, tickets are created and tickets are closed automatically and comments are added automatically, uh, the team can basically focus on GitHub and still get somewhat good reporting on Jira. Not on a technical purpose, but it's actually for both purposes. Well, do they come to the time frame of the previous issue or not? Uh, so for this part, Okay, so for the record, engineer, I guess, yeah. <laughs> in the back is saying that they have some automatic solution which translate GitHub issues to Jira. Uh, I'm aware of it, but it's different team from team. Some teams need it for planning, some teams need to track everything from GitHub, and some there is probably community impact much bigger. So, you know, on top of that, we work with thousands of communities, right? So we need to pick and choose which one like makes sense. For example, kernel makes sense a lot of time, like makes a lot of sense to sync with, but others may not. So we cannot force the world to work our way. Yeah, yeah. And exactly. And you know, from the audience for anybody online, you know, the point is is certain things work for certain teams and we can't force the world to work our way which if we could, we'd all be really happy. Our lives would be easy. We'd actually, three of us wouldn't be up here presenting, we probably wouldn't even have a job. So uh, it's really important to know, you know, you can't force a square peg into a round hole. You have to find the processes that are worth adopting and that are, that actually would yield a benefit and find that fine line between that, that collaboration. Uh, maybe I would like to point out that <clears throat> once we go for a standard, um, it requires some some level of maintenance. So, uh, for example, the in, um, integration between GitHub um, and Jira, there is some work um, in the background that, like Shepard, like the automation can get broken. Uh, the standard can get, like the way how you do it, it can get broken. There is some maintenance cost to connect it to it. So each time you go for a standard, keep in mind that there are some costs um, to it as well. Um, and it doesn't make always sense to standardize everything. Uh, as uh, Rudyank from the audience mentioned, like there are thousands of communities. If we attempted to standardize them all, why, why would we? The costs were just too high, too high, unrealistic. Any other interesting questions? <laughs> <laughs> Only interesting ones. <laughs> if you have a boring question, we'll take those in the hallway after. <laughs> I can follow up to your question a little bit because we our GitHub uh, is like a uh, very very large like community environment, and we really struggle to translate issues reported by people into our side of Jira. Uh, and the way we have to do it is we have community managers who are going through all the issues, uh, putting them into one Jira project project which is open to the public, so we can take in uh, external developers who are very very active on the, the GitHub. And they can put them to one one Jira project, which is external, and then the developers can pick from the scope of this and then bring it to the internal project for actual development. But you can break the communication. I mean, if something you want to happen to one side, you probably want to ship it on the other side. Yeah, true. It's, it's again very, 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 very difficult. But it's a way to have help filtering issues down, so the developers can only focus on the the priority tasks rather than having to go through really thousands of issues constantly on the GitHub side. So for the people on the stream, that was a boring question because GitHub is mentioned all the time and how to connect it to projects. <laughs> it's not easy. <laughs> Each of them is doing it differently because they need different data. As you said, you have private and public project. It's possible, but there is no unified solution which will be good for everyone. And it's not easy to set up. It's breaking. Oh. So some non-GitHub related questions? <laughs> <laughs> what does it mean for you when you introduce a standard? What is this? A documentation, a enforced rule, or? You want to take it? Yeah, sure. So what it means for us is a lot of communication. And the standards that we're implementing shouldn't come as a surprise to teams. The thing is, is that we are embedded in the teams we're working with, and the reason for the standardization usually bubbles up from the teams themselves expressing a concern. And so that means we're engaging with them all along the way. So when it's implemented, we usually do a small pilot, make sure things are working, and document it. 
very well in, you know, where, wherever people can find it. Uh, I think we are out of time here, but we can talk a little bit more about that offline if, if you'd like. All right. Thank you all.